Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Wednesday Florida Friendly Landscaping class. Today, we're going to be covering bugs, bugs that bite, sting, or even just taste you. Um, let's see if I can move this. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities in the Water Department. Here is my email, very big here. If at the end of this class, you are interested in um, seeing this in writing. I'll be glad to send you a PDF version of our PowerPoints. So here's my email, that's the best way. If you put it in the chat, I might not see it again. So the best way is to email me at lilyb, two L's in the middle, L-I-L-L-Y-B at hernandocounty.us and ask for a PDF version of this today in class, um, I welcome Karen again from Hernando County Mosquito Control. Um, she's actually going to have a good portion of this class today. We're going to let her talk for a while because in, in um, bugs that bite, sting, or taste you, mosquitoes are right up in, uh, you know, right up in there is one of those that do that. Of course, we can't cover every insect that does this today. And I just emailed Dr. Lester, but he's busy this morning. He's actually running around to a uh, in-person class at the Ohm Center. Um, so he should be here soon. Um, I emailed him and asked if we want to uh, consider a part two for this in March. So then we will cover even more. So if we don't hit your favorite bug today, <laughs> we might hit it in part two. I'm gonna to start today with bees and wasps. You know, kind of our, what we, when we think of bugs that sting you, of course, these are the first things we think of. And we've all had some very unpleasant experience with a bee sting or a wasp sting. Um, and if you um, actually have allergies, this, you know, that's a whole different story. Then you should have an EpiPen, you know, you should be knowing how to take care of yourself in that situation. And you are going to react to one bee sting, you know, even it could be a very, very serious situation. Uh, but for those, of, and I would say for those of us who aren't, but you never know also when you might develop those type of allergies later in life. So it could be a dangerous situation. But uh, what I'm gonna talk about before I talk about the bees and wasps that cause us angst and issues, um, what I wanna point out to you is that there are whole lots of bees in Florida. We have a tremendous amount of native bees, actually all over the United States, we have a tremendous amount of native bees. When we think of bees, we think of this guy here, here he is, this, uh, you know, European honeybee. That's what we think of every time we see a caricature of a bee, you know, we see this guy there, her turn and look, there you go. Um, we think of those types of bees, but there are all kinds of bees. So I'm gonna cover some of the native bees um, that we have here in Florida. And some of them are sweat bees. They are small to medium size. They don't sting. They might land on you because they're called sweat bees because they are attracted to your sweat and they might actually, you know, drink some of your sweat off of your body. So it's Hello. one of those, it's one of those that maybe you thought um, was a horse fly or a deer fly come, or something like sit. that. And let me ask to unmute Karen, there we go. And, um, but it, you know, it could have been one of these sweat bees and you just brushed it off of you. It only slightly, maybe slightly irritated you with its feet or something. So, and they're in these categories that I'm giving you, just so you know how many are out there, just in the sweat bee, family, there are 66 known species, different known species, just in Florida. So here's some bees that, you know, are not going to sting you or, and look how pretty they are. And also in this picture, 
look what's all over him. He's in a flower. Bees are generally very hairy. And so what happens? They get in these flowers and all over their hairy bodies, they pick up all the pollen. Then they go to the next flower and you know, there you know, go, that's how they, here comes Bill, Karen, if you can let him in, see if you can make him a co-host. Um, they are very, 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 very efficient pollinators. Our best pollinators we have out there are our native bees. Leaf cutter bees and mason bees. Okay. Um, leaf cutter bees, if you ever see anything like this out in your yard with these perfect little circles, look, someone looks like someone took one of those old fashioned hole punchers and went out there with the leaves. That was your leaf cutter bees and they're doing that to line their nests to get the leaves to line their nests. 26 known species of leaf cutter bees in Florida. And when I say known, that's because believe it or not, you would think by this time on earth, we have discovered everything there is to discover. And what's actually pretty exciting is no, we haven't. There are insects out there that we haven't named or discovered yet. And that's really pretty interesting. So. The leaf cutter bees are medium to large. They've got a lot of hair, so they're carrying um, pollen around on their abdomens. And they and the mason bees, they enjoy the cavity type nesting. So, let me see, Bill. I'm gonna make you a co-host, Bill. Okay, welcome, thank you, glad you're here. Um, the mason bees and the leaf cutter bees are these cavity nesters. That's why they um, they sometimes enjoy some of the pollinator houses, the pollinator hotels that we make. You do have to be careful with those. Um, sometimes they tend to cause more trouble than you know. We're trying to help the bees, but if we don't properly clean out those um, pollinator hotels. I think what they say to do is if you have one, um, line it with some like paper, some specially made paper for it and clean out every year and take them out so that the bees can start over again because otherwise there's um, parasitic wasps and we're gonna get into that, that could take over their homes um, and cause all sorts of trouble for them if we don't clean that out. But the mason bees, there's 14 known species of those in Florida. They range from small to large. Most are a metallic dark blue, not all of them. Some of them are kind of black. Um, and the mason bees, why they're called that is because they use, utilize a mud type substance um, for their cavity nesting. All of these native bees that I'm talking about are what we call solitary. That's another thing we're trained to think about bees and we're trained to think about all of them living in hives, when really only a honeybee and a bumblebee lives you know, in hives. There may be a few others out there. Most of them are solitary bees. Therefore, they don't have the mentality of hive defense. So therefore, you know, they're not very, very aggressive at all. Here's some others. Like I said, the bumblebee, and yes, a bumblebee it will sting you, but they're very non-aggressive. You, I mean, who hasn't held a little bumblebee in you know, their hand like this when they were a child or possibly as an adult, maybe I may or may not have done that. Um, but you know, it's just kind of exciting that, whoa, I've got a baby bumblebee, you know. Um, and I mean, you have to irritate that poor thing to death if, to get it to sting you. But bumblebees, they're large and there are six known species. So they are social and that means they live in groups, but yet they are uh, really non-aggressive um, and very, very, very hairy. Very fluffy little things so that that is a great adaptation to take all that pollen from one flower to the other flower and be extremely efficient pollinators for us. 
The other we have here are cuckoos. They actually, um, they're not very hairy because they are thieves. <laughs> they, um, what they do is they go into a home already created by a, another bee and they steal the pollen out of there and put their babies in there. So they're kind of pollen thieves and um, they utilize work that other bees have done. So therefore they don't need to be all that hairy because they don't need to do the pollen collecting. And they can be small or large and there's 73 known species of those in Florida. Might look scary, don't really cause a problem. Carpenter bees, um, they can be pretty large. Uh, well, there's two types. There's the large type and the small type. And there are five known species of carpenter bees in Florida, and they are wood boring bees. Again, the solitary, they're not looking uh, to defend a hide. Longhorned bees are fantastic pollinators of tubular type flowers, flowers that you know you gotta work to get in there uh, to get the nectar and the pollen. Um, so there's 24 known species of these. They can be medium or large. These actually are specialists. I mean, there are some longhorned out of those 24 known species. Some of them are specialists on sunflowers or squash. Um, but that's not the norm. The norm is these, these guys will go anywhere. So that is very helpful in pollination in the world. And these are, guys are very hairy. Very hairy means they're gonna spread the pollen around. Now you've seen these holes in your yard here, haven't you? You might've wondered what are those? Well, it's some kind of mining bee. Um, solitary bees there, they don't sting anybody. 63 known species of those in Florida. Um, they can, there's you know two different categories they put them in. Drana, which are, can be small to large, or Perdita are very, very, very small. And they dig those holes there that you see in the ground. Again, they're not gonna sting you. And we also have our plasterer bees. They're quite hairy, as you can see there. Um, there's different types. There's the collates, collets, sorry, they're, that are black with light hairs and an often striped abdomen or there's the hyleus, which is yellow-faced. They can be very small up to large, and there's 63 known species of these in Florida. So what we're pointing out here is there's a whole lot of bees out there um, that are just out there doing their job, pollinating. They are the pollinator experts. They're the top of the top, most efficient pollinators for us. What we think of as pollinators are, of course, our um, honeybees, and we're going to get into those. They are pollinators, but um, out there just doing their job very efficiently are all these native bees, and they're not stinging anyone. I love this particular picture I found because this uh, bee here is on uh, turkey, uh, turkey, fang, turkey tangle, fog fruit, frog fruit, match head, we, tiny little uh, ground cover that a lot of us consider a weed. But you know, you see, there's the bee on it. You see all that pollen all over it. It's spreading the pollen around, and that bee is most likely not going to be at all attracted to a piece of turf in your yard. But if you have some of this mixed in, you're helping the pollinators out there. So many of the native bees are very, very hairy, which means, again, there are top efficient uh, pollinators as well. Now, wasps, wasps, we just hear the word. We don't even like the word, do we? I'm not overly thrilled with the word wasp. I mean, we all have, um, we've had bad experiences. <laughs> Let's just say that with wasps. I remember one time, we were on a family road trip, so I don't even know. We were somewhere out west. Back in the days when, you know, kids could just fly all around the car as much as they wanted to. So by that time, I was up in the front seat 
unbuckled, you know, flittering around in the middle. And um, I turned around on my knees to talk to my sister in the back seat. You know, you know how unfettered we were. And I started screaming. I was about eight. Started screaming. And my mother instantly started yelling at my sister, <laughs> wondering what she had done to me. But um, through my screaming, I was trying to say it wasn't her. I was trying to defend her. I had kneeled on a almost dead, but not quite dead wasp. And my, you know, the stinger went right in my knee. So <laughs> we all have extremely, you know, unpleasant memories with wasps. But again, what we're doing is because of our unpleasant memories with a few, we're blaming the whole entire species. When in reality, there are so many types of wasps out there, they haven't even begun to find them all. And so I'm just gonna cover one group of um, non-stinging wasps that are doing fabulous work out there for us, uh, which are parasitoid wasps. This is, you know, maybe not a pretty picture up here, but there are thousands of species in over 40 families that aren't going to sting you out there. And what they do is they kill caterpillars. Yes, sometimes it's the caterpillars of the pretty butterflies that we want. That's just nature. <laughs> sometimes it's pests for you know agricultural crops or pests to our ornamental plants. So what they do is they lay their eggs either on or in the body of their host. Here they have laid them on this caterpillar and eventually over time it, it uh, you know, paralyzes the caterpillar and kills it with the toxins. The other ones who actually lay their eggs inside I'm gonna get kind of gross here. They lay their eggs inside of the host. And then when the pupae hatch, they eat their way out. They've got a ready meal because they're inside of, you know, um, this host, this caterpillar, and they eat their way out. And of course, caterpillars die. None of those wasps are going to hurt a human in any way. And they can be very small or they can be up to three inches long. That's just, a taste of the many different types of wasps that are non-harmful to humans. So they can pollinate, you know, they just maybe by circumstance, happenstance that they pollinate, but their biggest job out there is to control all the other critters. Some we do want around, some we don't want around, but it's all part of the cycle of nature. You know, all the checks and balances. So now let's get to the guys that really bother us. <laughs> Actually, these guys, we give them a pass, I think, because they're kind of cute. You know, they're kind of attractive. And we've been conditioned, yes, European honeybees sting, but they do a lot of good. So we're kind of like, we have a love-hate relationship with them. We tolerate them. We don't want to be around them, unless you're a beekeeper, um, but we... We tolerate them because we've been convinced that we can't live without them. And really, they're not the only bees that we can't live without. All those native bees I just told you about, you know, it all works together. It all works um, in tandem with each other. These European honeybees are not native to the Americas. They were brought over with the Europeans, you know, who for thousands of years kept bees and realized that was the way to have good crops. They weren't thinking or relying on our native bee population. They wanted bees that they could have right there at their crop and release. So again, they, oh, I mean, even in biblical times, they, you know, kept bees. So over thousands of years, um, they have been kept bred to be tame-ish. Now, there's not a beekeeper out there who hasn't been stung, but they're not being stung by the thousands of bees that might be, you know, all around them. So 
um, they've been bred to be kind of tame for those that are, you know, kept bees by humans. But, you know, they escaped and they made their own wild colonies. Still tameish, but in, if they're going to defend their colony. So, of course, there are stories of people who have been stung multiple times and who died. And um, my mother's father was one of them, someone I never knew. You know, that happened to him as well. But generally, we've learned to tolerate these bees. There's 20 or more subspecies of these. Of course, they are social, so they will defend their hive. That's our European honeybee. Now these, this is what has been a scare and calmed down in the past five years or so. But when we were first hearing, remember we were hearing about the killer bees, the killer bees are coming. So I will tell you the story of these killer bees. Remember I told you the Europeans brought the uh, European honeybees over here and that did fine, except like in South America or so, they just didn't do as well. They weren't made for that climate. So they thought, well, let's go to Africa and bring their honeybees over and try them in this climate. And just like some Jurassic Park movie, before they got out of their quarantine, before they were thoroughly um, finished researching them and they established wild colonies. So the it's African honeybees and this is interesting because they think what developed their behavioral tactics over thousands of years involved humans. The European honeybees that I just discussed, like I said, we've been uh, taming those, tame being a relative word, you know, since biblical times. Um, the way that it happened in Africa, just the culture or whatever, is people were more so, um, they didn't farm the bees, they would go and kind of raid the honey out of the wild bee um, colonies. So the bees developed over time to be even more defensive <laughs> from the raiders. That and climate and many other issues made them just much more aggressive. So what happened you know, in South America, of course, they got out and they're very, 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 very closely related to the European honeybees. So they're able to interbreed. Um, so that's when we got the word they weren't African honeybees anymore. They were like a hybrid and we call them Africanized honeybees. And they spread like 200 miles per year. Then it kind of slowed down, but eventually over time has made its way to the United States. So then there was this panic about that. They're smaller than European honeybees. But if you come upon a European honeybee, a pure European honeybee um, hive, and you disturb it, they're going to send out about a dozen workers after you, you know, to get you. And you, the best thing you can do, don't stand there swatting them. The best thing you can do is run, run out of their zone, get out of their defense zone. These Africanized honeybees will send hundreds after you. That's where the problem lie and why they're you know, so much more dangerous. Also their defense zone is bigger. Really the only thing you can do is find a car or a building to get into to get away from them. I mean, you might bring a few in with you but it'll be a more manageable amount. That's the only thing you can do. And you're going to be in there a long time because they also, unlike um, European honeybees that'll wait around a few minutes, they'll be there a long time waiting for you. They're really mad. So that's the best thing you know you can do with those. Um, what you, uh, how you can tell a European honeybee from an Africanized honeybee is you can't. It really can only be done in a lab. They count their venation. They even do DNA tests. But you can tell by behavior. And that I say with a word of caution as well, because they can behave like regular old European honeybees for a long period of time until they don't, until something sparks them that it's time now to defend. Um, one of the ways is um, they, 
either one will uh, create hive in a tree. So this isn't the greatest pictures, but I couldn't really find what I was looking for. But the African uh, Africanized honeybees, they tend to create hives that defy the laws of physics and nature. They, they're just keep going on and on and on and on and on that like nothing is holding them there, but that hive is continuing to grow. They will also are more likely than African than European honeybees to choose something um, you know that humans use to go ahead and nest in, such as a grill that's outside. Uh, what often happens is um, the cabinets on the side of the road, the metal cabinets where the uh, traffic light workers, you know, control the traffic lights in those metal cabinets, they get in there a lot. So it's just something to learn to be cautious of. I think what they're hoping now is that over time that the attributes of the European honeybees will calm the um, Africanized honeybees down, that they will breed more and more and more with the Europeans so that the calmer attributes are the ones that come out and not the massively defensive ones. Okay, now let's go to wasps. Um, the kind of wasps that you could run across. And, you know, I'm not a huge fan of coming across a wasp either. And wasps aren't cute. Bees can be cute, so we're more forgiving of them. Wasps, we look at them and get angry. And part of that is uh, cultural condition. Part of that is because, you know, we've been stung. And part of it is because they are unattractive to us. So the cicada killer, otherwise known as a giant ground hornet, I don't like that name. I think I like cicada killer better because I'm not a cicada. But there were two species in Florida. You got to really work to make them sting you, but with your handling a female, she will sting you. I think that's just a general rule of life, isn't it? <laughs> Here's another one you're going to run across, uh, mud dauber. We hear about these a lot. Um, and they because they make their homes on our homes. And sometimes I think they even call the paper wasps, which I'm going to show next mud daubers, they just kind of group them all in the same, but they're not the same. These mud daubers are rarely aggressive. They build their brood chambers out of this muddy like substance um, in close contact to us so we don't trust them. We think they're gonna sting us, but we really have to provoke them to get them to sting us. Now this paper wasp, see, I, even when I was creating this, I was like, find myself, getting angry <laughs> at this slide because we all had a run in with a paper, paper wasp and their stings hurt. They hurt a lot. They hurt more than bee stings. And these guys, you know, they build these out of like a papery substance. They build these nests up under our eaves, right near our house. And also when we are uh, pruning shrubs, they like to be under there. And I know I've been stung and that sting you know, the term mad as a hornet, I'm thinking um, they're referring to the person more than <laughs> the hornet because it does make you mad and it hurts a lot. But these are some wasps that um, are more likely that you're going to come in contact with and they're going to sting you. So those are ones you want to keep um, control of and keep them off of your house. You just have to keep um, a good eye out for them, get them away. And here is the one that, you know, we all just, our blood kind of turns cold when we hear about yellow jackets because there's been so many stories, you know, and bad stories about these. And they generally, because they are so aggressive when disturbed. And this is something you're gonna have to have a professional move. Please don't try this on your own. Have a professional come out. Usually their nests are underground, but they can be subterranean as well as um, you know, sticking above the ground, or they could use a cavity like is in this uh, brick structure here, where it's partially out and partially in. And these are very, very dangerous. And I would suggest definitely having a um, professional remove those. 
And here are some resources where I got a lot of this information. Um, and again, I'll be glad to send you a PDF of this so you have this um, in writing and you can find these sources and learn more about some of these uh, bees and wasps. And now we're gonna move on to Miss Karen and she's gonna talk to us about mosquitoes. There we go. Okay, I thought I'd start with a very eye-catching slide. As I introduce myself, my name is Karen Mojica. I work here at Mosquito Control. Um, Mosquito Control is a department within the county. Um, and our main responsibility here is to make sure that we keep the Hernando County residents safe from these biting mosquitoes, which fit into our category today. And as you can okay. see on the slide, the mosquito is the most deadliest animal in the world. Oh, I'm sorry, you're still there. That's okay, okay. <laughs> um, it's hard. I have to kind of prompt Lily here when my slide needs to change, but I'm ready. Um, okay, so to start off, um, a lot of what I want to talk about today is how to make your life more comfortable because we're all going to have to live with mosquitoes. There's no um, way around it here or pretty much anywhere. Mosquitoes are all over. Um, just for a quick bit of information, there's about 3,500 species of mosquitoes in the world, 175 of them in the United States. And here in Hernando County, we deal with about 40. Um, so our technicians are very um, knowledgeable on the 40 that we deal with and always uh, on top of things with how their environment. But let's start with the mosquito life cycle. Um, I always thought mosquitoes just like to live near the water because it was just a good environment for them, but it's not exactly that. They actually need the water. So the mosquito life cycle, when they lay their eggs, as you can see in the slide here, they need to live in water for those first seven to 10 days. And here in Florida, our weather gets very warm. So that can actually shorten to about four days. So those mosquitoes lay their eggs. It could be on the water, on the side of the water. You have a bird bath. Sometimes it's like on the top edge and they wait for that water to arrive. Once those eggs um, hatch in the water, they become a larvae. And you'll usually see them over in your gardens. Um, you'll see the little wiggly, um, little wiggly guys in the water. Um, they're, those are mosquito larvae. They are waiting to hatch. So if you do see those in any kind of water containers, uh, water sitting, you wanna dump those out because they need the water to hatch. If you eliminate that water, you've eliminated the possibility of those mosquitoes hatching. So from the larvae stage, they go into a pupae stage. Um, as larvae, they do eat, they have to breathe. So that would be um, in still water. They can't be in like a moving river and they, they won't be able to siphon the air from the top. Um, they go into that pupae stage, which they no longer eat, but they still need the air from the top. So it's, uh, uh, they'll be there. And then from there, they'll hatch into their flying adult. And then the process goes and begins again. Um, go ahead, Lily. Okay, so now they've hatched and you have your female and your male mosquito that have hatched from those eggs. Um, only the mosquito, the female mosquito, will bite people. Um, the male mosquito doesn't need that blood from the human or from the animal in order to produce eggs. So they'll, they're kind of our pollinators. They fit into that pollinator category. They'll go around and they uh, get nectar for their food. But that female knows the minute she's born that she needs to find that blood meal to get that protein to produce eggs. That's her job. Um, is to make her eggs. So as soon as she's hatched, she takes a couple hours to dry up and get ready. And then her um, main goal is to go out and find a blood meal to produce eggs. All right. Um, there are different species. As I had said, we have about 40 species here in Hernando County. Um, and the difference of the species matters, it matters quite a bit. Um, and their habitats and their behaviors um, are what tells us what mosquito, uh, the guys when the technicians go out looking um, to take care of the mosquito problem, they'll ask these questions. We'll ask, is it a nighttime biter, a daytime biter? 
Um, what type of environment are you finding it in the grassy areas? Um, you know, where you're finding these problems because the type of mosquito they are determines their behaviors um, and, and what diseases they could be carrying. So um, I guess that's about it there. I'm ready. Okay. Oh, okay. So here in the county, we do have some mosquitoes that can transmit diseases. That is why we're here. Um, our most common in Florida here is the West Nile virus, triple E, um, which is Eastern equine encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis, and Western equine encephalitis. West Nile and triple E, the Eastern equine, are the two that we see most. Um, and they're spread by the mosquito. Um, so you want, we want to make sure that if any of this variety of mosquito is in our area, that we go and attack that, that area and treat it well, because um, these are deadly viruses and you know, we want to make sure that we keep our citizens healthy and provide, you know, present, prevent them from spreading. We don't seem to come across, uh, we've had a couple of really good years where we haven't uh, had any, any um, impacts from these. Um, but the triple E and the West Nile can be deadly in horses, which is something we really monitor for. Um, there are now vaccines available for horses. Um, heartworm with dogs and cats are a little different. That's a different species of mosquito that carry those. Quite a bit of them do. There is a lot of mosquitoes that we have in our county that do carry um, the, the parasite for cat and dog heartworm. So we always suggest to keep your, your pets protected. Um, they do have medications to keep them. Um, so if that parasite gets in to the dog or the cat, these uh, medications can kill that parasite before it can go and lead into a heartworm. So you want to make sure that your dogs and cats are protected and your horses as well. Um, it's really hard to keep the pets from getting bitten by mosquitoes. You know, they're out there. Um, so they're out there in the wild. So now our technicians, the job up here at Mosquito Control is for us to make sure that we are keeping the county safe from all the different species of mosquitoes, which entails of course, all different things, um, depending on where they are, such as if you're in Hernando Beach on the west side, you're going to experience a different mosquito than the people in Brooksville on the east side. Uh, it's a different environment and they you know, have the areas that they like, the environments that they live in. So what we do is we make sure that we do surveillance throughout the county that monitors the amount of mosquitoes we're coming across, the variety of mosquitoes we're coming across, so that we know the best way to treat it. Um, then from there, once we do the surveillance, then we have a biological control that we can uh, then take on, which will in turn, um, and then also reduce our, our quantity that are out there. And we can do that through larviciding and adulticiding. And then there's also public outreach, which is something I like to do to get the word out that um, what to look for, what to keep your home most safe from getting mosquitoes is what you can do on your own. So go ahead, Lily. So our surveillance, we go out, we do trapping in different areas. We have traps sent out, set out throughout the county. Our guys are out there weekly uh, to set the traps and retrieve. Uh, they actually come in with little containers uh, with mosquitoes and they identify those. They identify what kind they are. Um, believe it or not, those little tiny things, they're able to tell what, they're, what variety they're looking at. Um, we have chickens that are set in coops throughout the county and we utilize those as well. Um, they go out and they draw blood weekly from the chickens. And the reason being is the chicken can they, they can tell us whether or not they've been bitten by a mosquito, a disease carrying mosquito. Um, they don't get sick, they don't show any signs, their eggs are still fine to eat, but their blood will tell us if they've created an antibody 
to a disease carrying mosquito, in which case then we know that they're in that area and we need to really make sure that uh, we take care of any breeding sites that could be there. Uh, we check our guys go out and they do landing rate counts, which is where they see how many mosquitoes are landing in, in a minute to see exactly how large of a um, amount that are there. And then we utilize our residents to tell us when there's, um, when they have a lot of mosquitoes. It's real important that if you're experiencing mosquitoes on your property, if you could let us know that, our guys will come out, they'll walk around, uh, see where they're coming from. It could be a drainage retention, it could be a tree hole, it could be something out of your control, you don't even know what's going on, um, but they can come out there, they will find it, uh, treat it, and make sure that it prevents those, because don't forget as they're breeding, they're moving and creating more and more. So the faster we can get on top of that, the better off we are. And that we do also do uh, inspections. They check uh, drainage retentions, um, anything throughout the county, all the uh, ditches and retention ponds are also uh, inspected to make sure that there's no sitting water there that could be breeding. Go ahead, Lily. Okay, so the biological control that we use here in our office we use um, gambusia fish, which are local bred fish. So we're not bringing anything foreign from a different environment, but we get these fish throughout the county. We bring them to our office where we have a large breeding tank and we create more of them. And then our technicians bring them out into the bodies of water that need these fish. Uh, the fish will eat the larvae, they eat hundreds a day. So if you have, um, a pond in your backyard, um, a large animal trough that your animals, you can't really dump that out. They're, they're very big. We can put them in there. If you have decorative ponds, we can put them in there. Um, any unmaintained swimming pools, if someone has a period of time that they're not able to run their filter and it's gonna get green, we can put fish in there to prevent any kind of breeding from happening of the mosquitoes. So these are our most, um, they're really our hard workers. Um, if sometimes you may have fish in a small pond and then you find you don't see them anymore. The birds like them. So if they've depleted your, your stock, give us a call. Our guys will be more than happy to restock. Um, make sure that those fish, if you have gotten them in the past, make sure they're still in there. They're kind of small. They're only about an inch, inch and a half long. They're kind of clear in color. Uh, they breed like a guppy. So once we stock them, they usually continue to produce to a point where we don't need to continue to stock it. But I have heard some interesting stories where large flocks of birds will all come in and, and have a snack and, and the breed of fish is, is depleted. So please always at any time, give us a call. This is um, one of our, our best means of controlling a small still body of water that you may have. Okay, and they are free of charge. Um, our next thing to do is we do source reduction. So we eliminate where those bodies of water are sitting so that the mosquitoes don't really have a spot to breed in. Um, as you can see on the photo here, that's a bromeliad, which is a beautiful plant that's all over in our area. However, they are little hiding spots for mosquito breeding. Um, if you notice, there's a cone top, a uh, little cup, they're like little cups and they have them at each leaf going down. And the mosquitoes are smart and they know that that water sits in that plant. So they will lay their eggs in there. When it rains, the plant fills up with water and it stays full for quite a while. Um, and those larvae will breed in there. So that's usually one of your first spots. If you have those plants, if you don't love them, I would recommend not having them only because they are, uh, you do need to maintain them. If you have bromeliads, you either need to use some kind of a um, granule in there or flush them out with your hose at least weekly because that, that is a huge breeding spot um, for mosquitoes. It's, it's really not a good spot. Um, 
the other thing is if you have tires, I don't know if you missed us, but last, uh, last month we had our tire amnesty day. And the reason why mosquito control is involved in tire removal is because that is a really big area that mosquitoes care for for breeding. And they're the ones that carry diseases. So it's um, some place where water sits. It's in a little dark crevice in there and it sits for a long time because it can hold quite a bit of water. So if you have tires and you missed our tire amnesty day, you can always bring them to the landfill. They take up to eight per year per household at no charge. Um, tire is, tires in your yard really can produce an unhealthy environment for your family. Um, so you wanna make sure either you cover them, bring them indoors, or just get rid of them if they're not needed anymore. Um, that's, that's a bad one. And then sometimes you'll have uh, plants out on a lake in your yard and they have they, they actually have mosquitoes that prefer to breed right on that plant, on the root, on the, um, they know just where to hide on those plants. So that's something that needs to be looked at as well. So we do, uh, do go into a little bit of the aquatic weed treatments and depending if it's not out of control. So you wanna keep um, on top of any kind of floating plants that you have on a, on a lake or a pond in your, in your yard. Okay, from there, once we find, we have, say, if you see in our picture here, we had a big rainfall, there's a swampy area, and our guys will go out there, and of course, they, th that water does dry up, it doesn't stay there all the time, fish aren't going to quite do it, so they do have to do a larviciding treatment. Um, larviciding is, is kind of like an oil that they'll put on the water, it'll float on top, it prevents that uh, larvae from being able to breathe. Um, it also will prevent that larvae from hatching. Uh, we use uh, very natural biological products, so it doesn't affect anything but our mosquitoes. Um, I believe it does mosquitoes and black flies, I believe also can be affected by the larvicide. But other than that, it won't harm fish, it won't harm birds, it won't harm anything else. It's a, it's a great product and that'll prevent those um, mosquitoes from hatching in this type of area. So, go ahead, Lily. And then uh, also on there, which I didn't touch on, is adulticiding. Um, sorry, thank you. Um, adulticiding is where we actually get to a point where all those mosquitoes have hatched, they're flying, you have a lot of them, and we need to actually send the truck. Sending the truck is our very last resort. Uh, we don't like to send the truck. It means that we kind of missed it in that larval stage and now it's gone to a flying adult. And that little particle of, of larvicide that is sprayed out of the truck actually has to touch that flying mosquito in order for it to have an effect. Um, so that's our very last resort. It's the hardest thing to get a control of because they actually have to have contact. Now, of course, we send our trucks out late at night. Um, they go out after dark. So any daytime biting mosquito isn't even out at that time. So we really, um, when, when people call in, a lot of times they'll call and request us to send the truck. And I try to go over on their call because I usually get the phone call and I'll usually go over with them that the truck isn't really the best. It's not our first means of treatment for sure. Uh, we first need to identify what we're dealing with, the species, if it's a daytime or a nighttime biter. Uh, we need to correct the source. That's, that's our most important. If we go out and we send the truck and it knocks down some of those flying ones, but they're still hatching and the next day you've got a whole nother group hatching, we haven't really fixed it. So our most important thing is to have the guys, our technicians, go out, identify where they're coming from. Um, sometimes it's a tarp in the woods. Sometimes it's a, a tire tossed on the side of a road. Um, like I said, sometimes it's clogged gutters, it's bromeliads, it's a container, a uh, flower pot. It could be so many things that can create these large uh, masses of flying mosquitoes. But our most important thing is to find that source and eliminate it so that if we do need to send the truck now to knock down those adults, it, it's completed uh, our treatment cycle. Okay. 
So now um, I'm always available to go out and, and talk with people and show them ways to avoid uh, mosquitoes in their yards, uh, keeping your gardening safe, your pets safe, your family safe from disease carrying mosquitoes. So if ever you have a group or anyone who would like to have information on how to inspect their homes and take care of it and, and just learn a little bit more about what we do, um, always feel free to contact our office and I'd be more than happy to do that. And usually you'll see us at like the Swamp Fest and um, the County Fair. Uh, we do a lot of local um, national night out. You'll see us there. Uh, we try to do the local events. However, this year uh, we've not been able to do that as we're all stuck. So a lot of my information hasn't gone out this year. Um, the best thing you can do, of course, is to always protect yourself wear your mosquito repellent, um, long sleeves, um, light colored clothing, and um, make sure that you're always out after every rain and dumping and draining anything that could possibly hold that water in your yard. And that's how you can keep your environment as mosquito free as possible. And then, okay. go ahead, Lily. Okay, so remember they have to have water. If there's no water, there's no mosquitoes. So always check your property, dump and drain, tip and toss. There's all kinds of neat little ways to remember. But usually if you do that the day after a rain, you've eliminated that four day cycle and eliminated their breeding. And then I think I just have one more slide and that's just if you need us, here is our phone number. We are on Facebook. Um, we have our website. Uh, with the county, you can go on there and actually put in a service request all by, you know, on your own. You just go in, click on it. It gives us the address and we're pretty quick. Um, majority of the time we're there within the next day. Um, so we can get out there. We can do whatever treatments necessary, explain to you where they're coming from so that you know what to look for the next time. And please utilize us. That's why we're here. And I think I'm all set. Thank you very much, Karen. That was very informative and very interesting. And I see there's a guy joining us who's like really dressed up. There he is. Got a tie on today. And I guess I'm you know. Dress like this every day. <laughs> you dress like this every day. Um, I have lots of videos to prove otherwise. <laughs> but apparently, this is a very important event. So he's put on a tie for us today, and we will let um, Dr. Lester take over with his portion of today's bugs that bite, sting, or taste you. Okay. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And I guess today's topic is very important. Different things that could bite or sting or take a taste out of you. And I don't want people to think that everything outdoors, everything in your yard is dangerous or is going to try to bite you or sting you. Because I have to caution people sometimes, you really don't want to try to sanitize the great outdoors. You just really want to be aware of some of these different things. And maybe these are things that you've seen in your yard before and you've kind of wondered like, gosh, I wonder what that is. Is it dangerous to me? Is it not? Most things, living things in your yard are not dangerous to you, but there are some that you probably just need to be aware of. And I think with most of these, if you avoid them, and if you just avoid picking them up and poking at them, you're gonna be absolutely fine. And a good example of this is we do have uh, several species of uh, caterpillars here in Central Florida that can sting you if you pick them up and touch your hairs. So how that happens is some of these caterpillars, like you see a picture of a saddleback caterpillar here, and it gets its name because it, it, it has kind of, kind of brightly colored back and almost looks like it has a little saddle on its back. And these caterpillars feed generally on oak trees. You may, if you have an oak tree, you might encounter one of them. And if you see those little hairs on the projectiles on its body, some of those hairs are urticating hairs. That's kind of the vocabulary word for today. And what that is, is some of those hairs are connected to tiny little poison sacs inside the caterpillar's body. And if you touch one of the hairs or one of the hairs gets embedded in your skin, 
it's like a hypodermic needle. If you're going to get injected with a caterpillar's venom, it will not kill you. It will not make you particularly sick. But from what I've been told by people that have experienced this, is it hurts really, really bad. So it's one of those things you definitely want to avoid. If you have children, you probably want to um, avoid or, or make sure that they understand what kind of caterpillars are out there. And generally, the only problem is with hairy or fuzzy caterpillars. So if you go to the next slide, this is a very, very hairy or fuzzy caterpillar. And the common name for this is a puss caterpillar. And it really, I don't think they really look like a caterpillar at all. I mean, you can't see a head, you can't see the legs. It looks like this little glob of fur that maybe your cat threw up or something. So um, not really sure exactly what that, um, what's, why somebody would want to touch one of them. But this is a serious problem. And I've seen articles written about this caterpillar from other states. They're here in Florida. They're all up and down the East Coast. And every summer, a number of people bump against these caterpillars, play with them, touch them, get stung. And they hurt very, very bad. A lot of times, people will have to go to the hospital or go and see your doctor. And there's really nothing that they can do for you other than wait about 24 or 48 hours and the pain will subside and go away and you'll be all better. And it, like I said, it's there's no really long lasting effects. You don't get an infection from them. If they're not poisonous like a rattlesnake um, would be or a coral snake, but they can hurt very, very badly. So next slide. Another really common caterpillar we have here, and they are gonna be coming out very, very soon. They come out every spring, and that's the tussock moth caterpillar. And these are the furry little caterpillars that people with oak trees have a problem with because some years you will get literally millions of these caterpillars in your trees. And then when they're all ready to go and make a cocoon and turn into a moth, they come out of the tree they crawl up onto the side of your house, up onto the siding, and that's where they make their cocoon. And people are always calling us and wondering, you know, what can I do to get rid of them? I really hate having to pressure wash the house every year. There's really nothing you can do to get rid of them. But tussock moth caterpillars, some people can have a reaction to. I've handled them before, many times in the past, and I've never had a problem with them. But they do have slightly poisonous hairs on them. And you want to be careful with them because if you're susceptible to it, you may uh, experience, you know, a certain amount of pain once those little hairs get stuck into your um, skin or into your hands. So some other things that people have problems with here in Central Florida are scorpions. We do have scorpions here in Florida, but we do not have the really big ones that they have out west that if they bite you, they could kill you. None of the scorpions here in Florida are poisonous enough where they're going to actually kill you. But they obviously have that stinging tail at the very end. You can see on the picture here. And if you encounter one of them and it stings you, once again, it's going to hurt really, really bad. You may have to go to the hospital or see a doctor about it. The only people I talk to that have problems with scorpions are people who have houses or live way out in the woods. So scorpions are in our forests, in our woods. If you live way out in the country, you may have them in your house. I know that if they are in your house, they really prefer dark hidden spots. So in the very back of your kitchen cabinets, way back there where you have the pots and pans you never use, that's where they like to hide. So you always wanna be careful reaching way in the back of the cabinet, especially if you have seen scorpions in your house or in your yard before, people tend to, if they have scorpions, they have a lot of them and they see them on a regular basis. But if you've never seen a scorpion on your property, chances are you don't have them. They are here, but they're not really all that common. We have some other species of closely related things like the giant whip scorpion. And we actually have one of them in our office that we're raising in an aquarium. And I looked it up just the other day. They lived to be about 10 years old, I think, some ridiculously long 
period of time for uh, a scorpion, and they, the, the one that we have at the office, it's got to be five, six inches long. They're big. And they look like a scorpion, but they don't have the stinging tail. And they're not going to sting you. They're not going to bite you. But they are large, and they do have the claws. They're going to bite, you know, grab a hold of you. What they do have is they can spray an ammonia-like substance at you. That's how they catch their prey. Uh, they really, really like to eat termite larvae roaches, things like that, that they find in the forest. They live underneath logs out in the woods. So if you encounter one, it may spray you and cause a rash on your hand or, you know, I wouldn't want to get something like that in my face or in my eyes. You're probably going to have to see a doctor about that one. So be aware that we do have other things like giant whip scorpions that live here in Central Florida. And you, if you're out in your backyard working, rolling over logs, turning over bricks and rocks, you may encounter one one day. I've never seen one out in the wild, but they are out there. So poking insects. We do have a couple different kinds of insects that are all in the same general family as stink bugs. And they all have the same kind of mouth part. They have a piercing, uh, sucky mouth part. So stink bugs will take their mouth part and poke it into your plant, poke it into a tomato or pepper in your vegetable garden, and they suck the water and juices out that way. Some of their relatives, like wheel bugs and other types of assassin bugs, are predators. So what they do is they catch other insects, and they take that mouth part and poke it into them and extract the insect's contents that way. As a matter of fact, I found a picture of a wheel bug in the uh, upper left-hand corner there that caught a puss caterpillar. So I guess it's kind of doing us all the benefit. That's one less stinging caterpillar out there. But you can see his mouth part. They have a short, very sharp, very thick mouth part. So if it's strong enough to poke into a caterpillar or an insect, it's strong enough to poke into you also if you catch one or start playing with it. So these are very common. You usually see these in late summer. And if you look at it, on its back, it has almost like if you took a tire or a wheel and cut it in half and stuck it on its back, that's kind of what it looks like. That's how it got its common name of wheel bug. There's other assassin bugs. The smaller one on the right is the uh, milkweed assassin bug. And they have a very strong mouth part. So if you did catch one of these or one of them jumped on you, it could poke you with its mouth part it's not going to happen very often because it's not trying to feed on you. You're not a very good host for wheel bugs or assassin bugs. But be aware that some of these insects, if you catch them and hold them in your hand, they may poke you and it's going to hurt. Next slide. So something that, especially if you live out in the country or if you enjoy hiking or visiting some of our wild areas, you will encounter certain times of the year are biting flies. And they're all in the same family, Tabanidae. And there's a number of different species. The one on the left is, uh, and they can buy common names like uh, deer fly, horse fly. Those are all common names that apply to a number of them. But the one on the left is a very large, probably half inch to an inch long, completely black fly. And they have a huge mouth. And if they land on you and bite you, you will notice it. It will hurt really bad. The one on the upper right-hand side here is a yellow fly. And certain times of the year, they will emerge and you will have a lot of them out in the woods. I've been on hikes before when the yellow flies were out. And they, I, I must have swatted 20 of them. And they just keep coming. Because what they do is they live out in the woods in wet areas or swampy areas. And that's where they um, lay their eggs. That's where the larvae feed. The larvae feed on decaying plant matter. And then when they hatch as adult flies, the females have to get a blood meal from either you or me or another animal to be able to produce eggs. So the females are all out looking for hosts that they can bite and poke into and get some blood out of you. Uh, so you really want to avoid these. They tend to be very seasonal. So they'll get really, really bad for a couple of weeks and then they kind of go away and are not as much of a problem. 
but they are out there. And I've been bit by yellow flies before, like I said, and they will get your attention. They definitely hurt. Next slide, please. So one thing that Lily also wanted me to mention today is ants. Because we get calls in our office about ants, and it may be little sugar ants or feral ants that are in your house or in your kitchen. Obviously, they're not dangerous. They're really tiny and they don't bite. But people do have problems sometimes with fire ants out in your yard. So first of all, remember that we probably have 50 different species of ants here in Hernando County that live outdoors. And they are not all fire ants. Half of the ants that live outdoors cannot bite. They don't have the stinger to bite into you. So if you get them on your hand or you pick one up, it can't even bite you. Some of them obviously can bite you. And if you do have a problem with legitimate fire ants, if you contact our office, we can give you some recommendations on what to use to get rid of them. But as a general rule, what works best is a bait. So if you get some kind of bait, a product like Amdro, and they have a number of newer baits out there now that work very well, and put them out, follow the directions, put a little bit around the mound, the ants will carry it in to the queen, and that's the best way to get rid of them. But please don't think because you see ants in your yard, they are automatically fire ants, and you automatically have to rush to the store and get something to put down to control them. We have things like harvester ants, and all they do is they eat seeds, they eat weed seeds. So if you have a problem with weeds in your, your lawn, they're actually helping you out by eating the seeds from the weeds. And we have a number of other species that don't bite, don't harm anybody, they're not fire ants. So make sure that you figure out for sure they are fire ants before you start putting down pesticides to control them. And I think those were all the different biting and poking things I was gonna to cover today, Lily. Yes, thank you. and. Um... Bill and I were in communication even while we were on here <laughs> when the other one wasn't speaking. We, through email, we agreed we're going to do a part two of this um, class sometime. When did we say March 16th, Bill? Um, I even have it on my calendar already. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll let you know when, and we're going to do March part 16th. two. Okay. And it's going to cover. Um, maybe some more depth about fire ants, but also what were some of the others that we, I wrote it down. Some of, oh, um, no seams, I'm sure. Fleas and ticks, lice, bed bugs and mites. Sounds like an exciting class, isn't it? But there's a lot, there's a lot to cover. Thank you, Dr. Lester. Thank you, Karen. Um, I was looking you. at the chat. Someone asked when a good time of year to clean out their pollinator box, I would say now. Right now, yep. Yeah, yep, it's a good time. And Karen, someone um, in Brevard County wants to know if she has a way of getting mosquito fish from Brevard. Yes. I did reply to her. Um, most okay. um, mosquito control departments carry these fish. They uh, just contact your local mosquito control department. They'll either bring them to you or have a location to pick them up from. Okay. Um, yeah, and Bill, I don't know if you're sitting in an airplane today or something, but you did have some weird buzzing audio issues going on, but there's not much we can do about that right now. Um, can you hear me better now? No, you still sound like you're talking through oh. a tin can. That happens sometimes with Zoom. Yeah. This is Wednesday. <laughs> um, here are our upcoming classes, my upcoming classes. Dr. Lester has even more. And like I said, we just added the 16th on. That'll be a Tuesday. And we'll talk about more creepy, crawly, stingy, bitey things as well. And we're still in, this is still in production that we're going to work on for April about um, life cycles in the earth, how death brings new life. <laughs> Whoops. Wadded, rotted, recycled, and rejuve. I hid it from myself. And resurrected. resurrected. <laughs> yes. Okay. And these are just working um, titles, may or may not be those titles. I don't think Bill's going to let me keep the Magical Mystery Tour with the Beatles, but <laughs> we will find out and we'll bring that information to you as well. Here are all of our emails. So if you have any questions for any of us, then please feel free to email us. Email me if you'd like a PDF copy 
of this class. And I think we've kept you a little bit over. So um, I don't see any more chat questions. I don't know if you two do. Um, but thank you. I'm sorry for the um, audio issues. Not always this is all stuff we can do about it. It did sound like you were on an aircraft carrier or something. So oh, I don't okay. know where you're going with your tie today, but you're you're on your way somewhere. But back to the office for another class. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. And Thank let you. me um, stop the recording. But everyone have a great week. Thank you. Oh, join Bill and I tomorrow uh, for the virtual plant clinic. Go to University of Florida IFAS at Hernando County's Facebook page. Find the link for our virtual plant clinic at 10 o'clock. Thank you and have a great week.